early risers. Okay. Good morning. I'm Scott Kennedy. I'm uh, uh, Deputy Director of the Freeman Chair uh, in China Studies uh, here at CSAS and also Director of the Project on Chinese Business and Political Economy. We're delighted to have everybody here. Uh, despite the early hour, we appreciate you all getting up uh, for what is a very important event. Um, I think everybody knows, just simply looking at the news, how important environmental issues are uh, and how more important they are. Uh, we've made a lot of progress uh, in en uh, environmental management policies over the last few decades. Uh, the recognition that growth and environmental protection are not at cross purposes. Uh, and we've seen a lot of technological progress from new energy vehicles, an uh, issue that I'm working on now, uh, to building materials. Uh, and we've seen a rise not only of, of national governments, but local governments and non-state actors playing a larger role than ever. Now, a quiet component of this progress has been uh, the role of Taiwan, uh, both on the island and externally. Uh, environmentalism is an important value to Taiwanese, and it's a, it partly explains the rise of uh, the Democratic Progressive Party, the DPP, which is a green party. You can see it every day in its flag. <laughs> uh, today, we're going to discuss Taiwan's environmental uh, uh, leadership, both on the island and externally. And we're delighted to have with us uh, Taiwan's environmental minister, uh, TechRose Deputy Representative James Lee, uh, a senior administrator from the US EPA, uh, Jane Nishida, and Dave Ribeiro from ACEEE. And we'll get to uh, everybody uh, later on. I first want to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Mike Green, senior vice president for Asia and the Japan chair here at uh, CSIS. Mike? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Scott. Good morning. Um, I want to welcome you all here. And in particular, I want to welcome our friends who came all the way from Taipei. Um, we are um, delighted to be hosting um, Minister Lee and his delegation, and also our distinguished colleagues from the Environmental Protection Agency and the ACEEE. Um, as you know, CSIS does a range of work on Asia with a particular focus on our friendship with uh, Taiwan which, um, as we've discussed in a number of uh, panels here, uh, is important not only because of the geography of Taiwan, not only because of the values we share as democracies, uh, but also because, as you can see and as you'll hear today, um, uh, Taiwan is playing a leading role in uh, agenda setting, uh, particularly on issues that transcend borders, um, uh, such as the environment. And we'll hear more today about the um, southbound policy um, and uh, work uh, that uh, Minister Lee and his colleagues are doing with Vietnam, with Cambodia, with Myanmar. Um, water and the environment are important for what the UN calls human security, the basic uh, livelihood and well-being of peoples across this entire region. It's also an important security issue. Um, I recently convened a group of, of uh, national security experts projecting long-term threats to stability in Asia. We sort of catalog the range of issues. Um, and the number one non-traditional uh, uh, threat, you know, the threat that was not uh, war or nuclear proliferation, was in fact water and the enormous growth in demand for water, the sensitivity of the Brahmaputra, the, the Indus, the Irrawaddy <coughs> um, to climate change and environmental degradation, um, and how that could draw uh, countries and peoples into conflict. or with the right patterns of behavior into cooperation. So Taiwan, although it's not the largest government in the region, as a thought leader, is beginning to point to ways beyond ideology and borders to cooperate on this issue so we can all work together. Um, I'm going to invite our, our friend from, uh, from Washington, uh, the deputy representative uh, from TechRow, uh, James K. Lee, to introduce um, our distinguished uh, minister and visitor from Taiwan, Dr. Lee. James K. J. Lee uh, was uh, born in uh, Hualien in Taiwan. <coughs> um, he studied in Taiwan and then wisely chose to study in Hawaii at the University of Hawaii. He's worked on a range of issues um, in e the EU, in the North American Affairs Desk, <coughs> and uh, was chosen um, several years ago as Taiwan's top diplomat. So there's not much more I could say after that. Let me uh, welcome you all and turn the stage over uh, to Deputy Representative Lee to introduce our speaker. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Michael, for your kind introduction and giving me this opportunity uh, to make introductory remark to Minister Lee. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, Minister Lee, uh, distinguished panelists, uh, friends, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, I want first to thank uh, the CSIS for hosting this event, uh, focusing on Taiwan's uh, environmental leadership. Uh, it is an important topic uh, that is not only for Taiwan and the United States, but also for the planet. Uh, I think earlier this month, uh, Pope Francis appeared for world leaders to heal our wounded creation. And Taiwan is uh, very proud to tell the world that it, is, it has been at the forefront of working uh, for a sustainable uh, uh, planet for all human beings. And we know that uh, environmental progress is always based on international cooperation. So uh, Taiwan has been vigorously pursued a close partnership with the United States to address uh, imminent global and regional environmental challenge. I think uh, uh, the main purpose of our uh, minister, Minister Lee, uh, visit uh, to the United States this time is to renew, strengthen this already robust partnership. Uh, in 2014, uh, Taiwan EPA and its counterpart, uh, U.S. counterpart, uh, officially launched the IEP program, the International Environmental uh, Partnership, uh, which is um, a network of experts uh, working together to address uh, a series of international environmental issues. And through this IEP platform, uh, Taiwan and the US EPA work closely to address issue of mutual concerns uh, and share our experience in electronic waste management, uh, air quality protection, uh, contaminant groundwater controls, and mercury uh, monitoring. Uh, we are glad that the, the CSIS offer us this opportunity to review its progress and the prospect of the IEP. And I would be remiss if I did not mention uh, the fact that last Friday, uh, Minister Li uh, introduced Taiwan's first voluntary national report review report uh, in New York City. Uh, it document Taiwan's concrete implementation and accomplishment in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And meanwhile, uh, Taiwan's MOFA uh, has recently released a short video uh, highlighting uh, Taiwan's collaboration uh, in the UN uh, SDGs and its effort to um, help, re uh, help ensure our planet's sustainable development. Uh, so I encourage you to watch the video, uh, both the video and uh, Taiwan's first uh, VNR, VNR report uh, show clearly that Taiwan is a valuable partner for a better world. So in closing, I would like to uh, join Minister Lee to assure you that Taiwan will continue to be a Stake, uh, responsible stakeholder and proactive contributor uh, to heal our owned planet. And I wish you all great success for today's event. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Deputy Representative Lee. Um, let me now um, introduce our uh, featured speaker for today. Um, Minister Lee has been uh, the head of Taiwan's Environmental Protection Administration since May of 2016. Uh, prior to that, he served for four years as a legislator in the Legislative UN, and he served elsewhere uh, with distinction in uh, Taiwan's government as Minister in the Council of Labor Affairs, as well as in the Executive UN, and he was Deputy Representative 
of TechRow here in Washington. Uh, so you can see two distinguished uh, holders of that position here as well. He holds a, a PhD from the University of North Carolina, and despite the fact that I went to the University of Virginia, I still think the, that's a great school. Uh, and um, he was an assistant professor at the University of South Dakota uh, as well before he returned to Taiwan to, to begin service uh, in the government. Uh, we're delighted to have you here today. We look forward to your remarks. Uh, I think I'm, I'm going to sit in the front row, even though you have these nice softer chairs up here, so I, we can look at, at the presentation. And then uh, at the end of your remarks, uh, we'll then uh, have a panel discussion continuing with you. So everyone, please join me in welcoming uh, Minister Lee. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And also thank you for Dr. Green's uh, opening remark. Uh, Deputy Representative uh, Lee and Ms. Nishida, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all the so many old friends. Uh, I, be, I was here 15 years ago. It's, it's time flies, time really flies. But it's nice to be back here. Although I do, uh, I did a company with uh, uh, President uh, Chai, when she was a candidate uh, on this very month, September 15, 2015, here also in the CSIS, when she published her uh, cross trade uh, policy and aroused quite a, a good and a positive uh, response uh, from here. And that's a good start. Let me tell you, that's a good start. Uh, for her campaign. Uh, so today, uh, thank you for CIS uh, to arrange uh, this important uh, uh, subject. I have the honor to share some of uh, what we have been doing in the past uh, 20, 30 years. Uh, try to reduce the pollution. <clears throat> and, and, and then that's just the uh, uh, more passive uh, way for doing the uh, environmental protection uh, affairs or jobs. We hope uh, in the future we would uh, achieve a society without any garbage, zero waste, change or transform everything into energy, into everything, anything that can be reusable. So the whole earth can be, everything can be uh, uh, circulate. So then we would not exhaust all the resources in this generation. We will save the uh, resources for the next generation and then the next, next generation. Yeah, that's uh, our idea. So once again, thank you for attending the, uh, uh, this conference. Uh, uh, most of you here are quite familiar with Taiwan, but still I would uh, uh, very briefly go through where we are. Uh, this beautiful island, when Portuguese pass by uh, the east coast of uh, Taiwan, they, uh, they were amazed by the beauty of the island. And they chanted, they shouted out, say, Ilos Formosa, which means uh, beautiful island in Portuguese. For those who know uh, Portuguese, you may correct my pronunciation, <laughs> but it's quite close. And then, uh, this, uh, when they pass by, this is Pacific Ocean, this is Taiwan Strait. As you can see, 61% are, are covered by forest. Okay, so we are 23 million uh, people, uh, population, about Texas. Is that close? Uh, Texas, okay. Yeah, so, um, but most people, about 6 million reside in this Taipei uh, area, metropolitan, and then Kaohsiung, you know, most living in the coastal area. So it's quite, uh, the population density is quite high. And we rely on the energy, uh, so much material or food, energy from outside. Oh, sorry, I got wrong. Uh oh, how to? Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. I push the wrong button. Yeah. Cancel the out of 
Thank you. Thank you, right. sir. Yeah, thank you. Real quick. So uh, <clears throat> we are we are the uh, the tenth uh, trading partner with the U.S. So our economy is uh, quite strong. Quite strong. And then this, uh, for those who haven't uh, read about this uh, uh, clip, uh, early this year, this, uh, this uh, <coughs> Business Insider report, the Taiwan rank number one in quality of life. And the indicators they uh, apply, including uh, safety and security, personal happiness, our uh, health and well-being, and cost of living, you know, everything. Uh, about 40 items. But uh, on top of Japan, Austria, France, Spain, Germany, Singapore, we rank number one. Of course, it, it varies from time to time. But most of the time, we are within the top five. We are within the top five. So we are proud of it. We are proud of it. Proud of it. <clears throat> and then uh, later, I would uh, uh, say a few on the government side, and then would put you some example on the private sector about how we do jointly, uh, government as well as the private sector, to achieve a more clean, a cleaner environment. And this is. <clears throat> After President Tsai was elected, in her inaugural speech, uh, the May 20, she emphasized we must not expand natural resources endlessly and to protect the health of the citizen. So uh, we have to monitor and control all pollution. So later I will. Uh, say uh, a few uh, policy, indicate some of the policies that we have been doing in the past uh, 30 years to achieve, uh, uh, to reduce the pollution, to control the pollution. But <clears throat> in the future, we would like to move toward a circular economy. <laughs> Sir, gentlemen, could you help me with that cursor? <laughs> I, like, I like the uh, pointer. Yeah, it's, uh, OK. Circular economy, yeah. Get rid of the, the cursor, I can just use that red light. Okay, good. Okay, good, yeah. Circular economy, turn, turning waste into renewable resources. Uh, this is very important, and today we have uh, the uh, chairperson, director of the uh, Taiwan uh, Circular Economy Network, uh, Charles Huang and Angela Zhang. Uh, would you? To, yeah, later, uh, if we you are interested more in this subject, they are really the preachers. I admire them very much. Yeah, to me, we can save uh, all kinds of resources for the next generation. I think it's a it's a very important issue. Not only an environmental issue, it's also an ethical issue. We should uh, take care of the justice of the gen next generation. It's cross generational. Uh, uh, justice issue. Okay. And in terms of all kinds of environmental issues, briefly, we can classify into air. Okay. Clean air, air is, and then the earth, and then the water. For the uh, caring for the earth, we are not going to allow uh, the solid waste to be dumped any place in the valley, underwater, in the sea. That is something we do. And clean, uh, if, you would, if you visit Taipei 30 years ago, like uh, Jen uh, was uh, uh, having high school. I shouldn't say too, too long, right? <laughs> <laughs> Some years ago, I don't mention 30 years ago, OK? Taipei, every day, when you stay in Taipei for just one day, your nose will be full of dust. I'm sorry to say that. And the color of your shirt, particularly your white shirt, will get dirty. 
But now, not anymore. I was proud to say in New York City, the air quality in Taipei is much better than New York City. <laughs> but about the same with Washington, DC, I think. <laughs> so you are safe. <laughs> you are safe. Okay. So, and then the circular economy. Uh, in terms of solid waste or garbage, okay, we do three things. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Every, everyone knows that. But now we also introduce the concept redesign in the very beginning. Okay? So, uh, but the most important thing is uh, to summary the, the achievement that we have been uh, 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 attained is that in this, in this uh, uh, headline, I, th I think it will say everything because the time is uh, limited. So let me move a little bit faster. And then in terms of the water, we will try to clean the river as well as the ocean. As you know, the Taiwan is surrounded by the Taiwan Strait and Pacific Ocean. So ocean is very important. And this handsome man here, you can tell who he is, OK? <laughs> we organize, mobilize the whole country in, for every county, OK? Uh, particular to uh, correspond the effort uh, by the World Oceans Convention in New York. Uh, it's on June, early June, okay? And the subjects are ocean of future. Here, we encourage, we organize all the 800, more than 800 uh, shipboats to uh, form this environmental fleet to clean not only themselves, not to throw any garbage into the sea while they were working uh, on the far sea, but also try to pick up any garbage you see on the surface of the ocean, okay, the, the, the fleet. And then we also hire so many divers to clean the, the bottles, everything, under the sea. And I would say sorry to uh, Lady Monroe, okay, because she is much beautiful than here. <laughs> but our high school girls just try to apply all those uh, debris, garbage that we collect from the, the sea and try to make it uh, into an art, to make it cynical. So try to remind uh, everyone, be aware of this. Try to protect uh, the sea, the ocean. And not only that, we also prohibit the usage, or try to ban, try to ban the usage, in, discourage, I should say discourage, the usage of plastic bag. But in the future, hope someday, the whole planet the whole humankind, would, everyone would try not to use plastic bags. Because, because when you see the whale's stomach full of plastic bags, and they stop to death. It's occurred in Taiwan, it's occurred in Norway, in the North Sea, it's occurred everywhere. So we should stop this trend. And not only that, we protect the big fish, whale, dolphin. We also have to take care of the little fish, the shrimp. The shrimp would eat the all these micro bits here. So we uh, next year, beginning next year, we are going to ban these micro bits. We are the first one, and about half year behind uh, uh, U.S. Okay, that's the water side. I can only uh, mention a few examples, and then the uh, air. Uh, the air is okay in Taipei, but because during the winter, the wind blows from northeast to the south, so they accumulate all these particles, PM, uh, you know, uh, to the central part and then to the south part uh, of Taiwan, and the air quality becomes so uh, unacceptable. So we introduce, we allocate in the next three years, allocate seven billion U.S. dollars about 200 billion NT dollars uh, for industrial or stationary resources, like one, two, three, like Thai Power, like, like Thai Power Company, they are the biggest emission uh, resources. Try to ask them to uh, turn their or uh, ex replace a more efficient machine or boiler. And not only for that, because one half from stationary resource, one half from the mobile source. Uh, so 
we are going to replace stage one, stage two diesel trucks. And then for the stage three trucks, we retrofitting these uh, diesel particulate filters. And we are going to replace one million, one million, let me uh, try to emphasize that, two-stroke motorcycles. We have more than 10 million motorcycles in Taiwan. So it's a big issue. And then this is the result, okay? From 1970, 1982 to 2016, everything, PM10, PM215, ozone, everything is decreasing, okay? But we are not satisfied. Well, we have to do all those 14 measures that I just mentioned. And then for this uh, uh, greenhouse gas reduction, uh, we set the goal by 2050, cut down 50%. By 2030, 20%. And we've written it into the law. It's one of the very few countries that has written their uh, targets into the law, stipulated that. Uh, who is this? You will find out who is this movie star later. <laughs> OK. This is our very James, beautiful Mr. Nishita here, and Vice President. Uh, when she visited uh, our vice president a few months ago. Yeah, and this is about the uh, cooperation with the uh, US EPA. We really appreciate uh, all you have done uh, together in the, in the past. And okay, this is AIT. And okay, I, we call it uh, International Environmental Partnership. Uh, the beginning, although we do have uh, subject by subject, uh, cooperation, collab collaboration in the past. But the more whole spectrum, uh, this uh, IEP began from 2014. And this is last year in Bangkok. This is my deputy. Okay? I have an a, a air quality conference there, Honei, and this in Taipei. And they, all these are, as, as you can see, all the uh, screens, TV screens, computer screens. All this e-west, you know, pile up like mountains. It's a big issue worldwide, not only in Taiwan, it's everywhere. And then uh, that, uh, this uh, IEP program, uh, we have hold more than 60 events and uh, invited more than 40 countries to join together, including this e-west, somewhere e-west. Uh, and then about the air quality control in Asian cities, okay? And then also this Asia Pacific Mercury Monitoring Network. Okay, in terms of this uh, Mercury Network, we do have very important uh, uh, monitor station here in Taiwan. This one is just under, on top of Ali San, uh, right under J Mountain. It's uh, 28, 100 or 2,800 meter high. Because it's so high, you can collect the, the good quality of air and use that as a baseline uh, to compare with the air uh, data that you collect on the, on the ground. And this is Dongsa Taiping, uh, Taiping Island. Uh, it's quite uh, busy in the Southern China Sea now, but here they still collect the data uh, day and night here. And we can share all this data together. And then with the seven uh, South East Asian uh, countries here, all together. And these are the spot, uh, Taiwan, and then several of uh, India, those countries. And this is the machine uh, uh, we applied. And then these are the events. Uh, held in so many areas. Uh, we like to uh, work together. And also, uh, we are going to uh, share our device, this monitor device, uh, with uh, our friendly, our friend countries uh, in the neighboring uh, states, Southeast Asia. Uh, by the end of the year, we are going to give out the 10 sets, and by the end of next year, 15 sets. So we can monitor the air quality uh, in this area. In fact, the air, the wind blow everywhere, blow from the east to west, from west to east. And in the winter, 
the wind storm blown from the north to the south. So we are really breathing the same air. We are living in this global village. You know, if you look into it, you can sense that, uh, uh, you know, that the feeling of family. And then here, you know, uh, we have a, a, cen center, a central lab in the uh, Central University in Taiwan. And here, uh, in Rhode Island this year, a uh, former uh, administrator, uh, Ms. McCarthy, appreciate what we have done in the past. This is our colleague from uh, our department, uh, from our EPA, and a big hug here. So uh, you can tell, you know, we have been working together so closely. Uh, he was so lucky. A very young uh, officer. <laughs> their, their boss, their deputy, their director general were quite envious. <laughs> and, uh, uh, uh. Okay, and then these are the uh, this network. Okay, about the, the e west. The past uh, few uh, slides are about the air quality control. We can only just touch upon one or two uh, because of the time constraint. Here, the e west. Okay. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, we Taiwanese people used our living room as a factory. We have that kind of stage. So everyone tried to peel off those uh, precious material or metal from those uh, keyboards or computer keyboard or, or TV screens, but then dump all those waste into the river. So it took us uh, quite a long time and spent lots of money to clean those rivers. So this is a big issue. We hope this will not occur, happen in our friend uh, countries. And so we invite them to work together, as you can see. And this, it's uh, those kind of e-waste travel worldwide, uh, worldwide. But we were able to, uh, to uh, 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 find out that through our prosecutors, office, and police work together. We have very good system. We call it a three-party uh, mechanism. Uh, always work together to find out who is poisoning uh, uh, the environment. And here, those are the, uh, the, the protection of the sea or the river. And then about this particular case, okay, when we found out uh, some ship passed by uh, <coughs> north, southeast, southeast corner of Taiwan and kind of uh, pollute the ocean and through this uh, uh, automatic identification system we were able to locate 10 of the ships and we traced them all the way to Australia. I sent my colleague all the way 3,000 miles to trace this ship and this is the captain of the ship and then they collect all the samples, all, all your samples, okay? And then analyze that. And we work together with the uh, Australian, Australian uh, Marine Time Safety Authority. We have very good working relation. And that is an example that we, as a country, has the will to protect the quality of the water, of the ocean. And this is the uh, publication by one of the newspapers there. OK, those are you know, air, solid waste, and then the, the soil and underground water protection. I, can, uh, I don't have time to mention much of that. And then the water or the ocean uh, area, seabed. Now, those are government uh, uh, side uh, efforts. Now let me uh, share with you a few examples, good examples from our private sector. See, this, FIFA, not too long ago, in Brazil, 10 teams, all their clothes are made of the PET uh, uh, bottles, recycled, uh, to make it into textile. It's very good, functional clothing. And then <clears throat> also try to apply all those plastic waste into, make it into usable bottles, 
sources or commodities. Just try to make best use of that from the West to the product. And this is one of the, uh, our young guys in his early 30s. He explored his career in Romania here, and he almost copied the whole set of our legal framework for this air protection, water protection, solid waste treatment, all the framework to Romania. And the minister said, that's great. So <clears throat> he, uh, from this recycling rate, from zero to 45, and now he owns 90% of the market share. I invite him to Brussels in, the, uh, in June, late June, and to uh, hold conference with the uh, European Union officers to work together to see how he can expand his business from Romania to the whole Eastern Europe, to the whole Europe. I think it's such a great idea. Try to recycle all the waste. And then this is his group in France. Uh, and then another example, this great young man, Mr. Huang, also, <clears throat> his company's name is Miniwis. He tried to use the minimum resources and try to make it best use of it. He collect all the plastic waste and recycle them and made it. He even like to make it into a plan, his ambition. Because his story, he can, you can find it, Google it, many ways. There are many inspiring stories about him, about his company. So he was able to, to invite so many young intellectuals in all kinds of disciplines from every country. And they are trying to, to do all this. I, I paid quite high respect to him. And this was a story told in Wall Street Journal. And then we use in Taipei, if you visit Taipei in Zhongshan North Road, this was built by 150 million bottles. The eco arc, we call it the arc, like a story, the arc about uh, <clears throat> in the Bible. And then he also produced this, produced this. He used all this as uh, interior decoration in Italy, in Germany, in Spain, in Great Britain, everywhere. A great story. And then in Chengdu, in Tianjin, everywhere. And then another young man, this, the you win, you can also nanotech, in also in his, in his 38. He developed, invent, these are all the precious metals uh, from all the ice, uh, you know, e-west, you know, keyboards, iPhones, or phone, all kinds of cellular phones, okay? I probably have to borrow three more minutes, okay? <laughs> uh, he's so innovative. And he earned the gold medal, first place, second place, uh, in all kinds of competition in the Pittsburgh International Invention Exhibition. And some of the very, very large, I, don't, I can't mention his name or their name, uh, of the just phone manufacturers, you know, billions of phones were produced a year. They come to his office, his factory, like to purchase all these precious metals, gold, nickels, uh, silver, okay, to, re to reproduce their next generation mobile phones. I, I, I thought that's very good, great stories. And in about 13 seconds, he can strip all those goals. And the old methodology use this kind of very toxic cyanide to retreat or peel down the metals. But in his solvent is safe. You know, it's real. I personally touched those solvents and see the peeling process of those metals. And then another example, we help, the government help our private sector to develop this, uh, uh, this uh, APP. You can download this too. Whenever you have big uh, or anything that you like to be recycled, a refrigerator, table, chair, whatever, you just make a phone call through APP, they will send truck to pick it up. Very convenient. So very huge, very success story in Taiwan. And we are more than willing to share all this with our uh, 
uh, neighboring states or worldwide? Two minutes. <laughs> news uh, southbound parties later. Maybe during discussion we can we can talk more about this. Okay, and uh, so many friends here from every uh, so many countries. And then the climate change issue. I have the honor to meet the uh, Her Excellency President President Hyman of Marshall Island uh, the day before yesterday. She shared with us the concern, the great concern of those island, Pacific Island countries. They are thinking, you know, their water, their underground water is, uh, is, is uh, uh, not drinkable anymore because of the rising tide. They have been living there for thousands of years. They don't know what happened. Tens of thousands of miles away when this uh, industrialization process began, began 200 years ago. And now, because of all this, you know, the ice mountain in the Arctic, in the southern pole, nearly down. And they don't know why, because they were all there. They don't know anything happened thousands of miles away. And now, they were disappearing. I would say this is also another ethical issue, justice issue, about the fairness between continental. So we ought to do something about this. So serious, it's a serious issue about climate change. We are, I don't have time, but later maybe we can discuss more, elaborate a little bit more. But certainly, as President Tsai said, we are not going to Sorry, last word. Yeah, here, last word. <coughs> we only have one Earth. We only have one Taiwan. So, we are going to address seriously about these climate issues. We like to attend, we like to contribute. But hopefully, the international community will hear what we uh, share with you and work together. Thank you. Thank you for your time. for um, uh, your uh, tremendous remarks. It shows how much uh, Taiwan is doing, both on the island and, and uh, globally, uh, to address environmental issues, things that we see every day, things uh, that we can't, such as climate change, which have such a, a big impact uh, on our lives. Let me introduce uh, to everyone our, our two uh, additional panelists, uh, and then uh, I'll put forward a few questions, and we'll, we'll get on with the discussion. Uh, to my uh, left is Jane Nishida. She's the Acting Assistant Administrator for EPA's Office of International and Tribal Affairs. Uh, and she previously was the Principal Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Office Director of Regional and Bilateral Affairs within uh, this current uh, office that she holds now. In her current capacity, she leads EPA's international and tribal engagements and works closely with tribal governments, foreign governments, international organizations, other U.S. agency partners on matters relating to the environmental policy and program, program implementation in tribal lands uh, and internationally. She has over 30 years of environmental experience working in federal and state government and uh, international and non-governmental organizations. Prior to joining EPA, she worked at the World Bank. And from 1995 to 2002, she was appointed Secretary of Maryland's Department of the Environment. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. All right. Uh, David Ribeiro is with the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. David joined ACEEE 
in the spring of 2013. He conducts research on energy efficiency implementation at the local level, including lead by example strategies and the interconnection between efficiency and community resilience. He also is the lead author of the City Energy Efficiency Scorecard and contributes to local policy databases. Prior to joining ACEEE, David was a policy advisor in New York City's De Department of Environmental Protection, working on environmental sustainability initiatives. I don't think he was responsible for the air issue you mentioned, <laughs> but we'll come back to that, I'm sure. Uh, he has a, 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 a master's uh, from Johns Hopkins and uh, a BA uh, from Holy Cross. So thank you for being here with us as well. Absolutely. Uh, well, let me get the, the uh, question started. I'm going to first start with Jane. Uh, uh, because uh, you've traveled the world, uh, not just uh, in Asia, but everywhere. And I'm curious what you find most impressive uh, about, your, about Taiwan and how it's managing its environment, and your experience uh, through EPA and elsewhere in co collaborating with Taiwan. What kind of progress has been made? Uh, what are our top priorities now? Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, CSI uh, for inviting me to participate on the panel and to uh, thank uh, Minister Lee for his kind remarks. And, uh, and one of the things that he mentioned in his remarks earlier was that not only in addition to the resume that um, was just uh, cited, that I had the uh, honor of also living in Taiwan many, many years ago, as he mentioned, uh, going to high school there. <laughs> Uh, and uh, one of the things that I noticed, as he mentioned, was uh, now at working at US EPA, what a tremendous, what a remarkable improvement, as he, allude, as he alluded to, that Taiwan has made, not only in terms of cleaning up the air, but cleaning the water, uh, contaminated sites. And just as a reflection of that, um, US EPA and Taiwan EPA first began its cooperation in, in 1993, so almost 25 years ago. And when we first began our cooperation, US EPA was essentially a teacher helping Taiwan improve its capacity. Now, frankly, uh, Taiwan uh, EPA is teaching US EPA in many fronts. And he, uh, Minister Lee alluded to the, uh, some of those uh, remarkable areas. So just in 2014, um, we launched a new partnership with Taiwan EPA, uh, which is called the International Environmental Partnership uh, Program. And under that program, we are tackling some of the uh, very important challenges that the globe now faces. Mercury was one, and Minister Lee um, shared with you what we are doing in terms of mercury monitoring. Next week, the Minamata Convention, the first COP of the Minamata Convention, will take place in Geneva. And what Taiwan is doing in terms of analysis and of the inventory of mercury is going to be critical, particularly for countries in the southbound policy to be able to meet their commitments under the Minamata Convention. In addition, Minister Lee talked about what Taiwan is doing through the uh, International Environmental Partnership and e-waste. Again, e-waste is obviously going to be a critical component for um, obviously uh, uh, partners around the world in terms of addressing the Basel Convention. So again, uh, Taiwan's leadership is helping, uh, I think, all the partners and all the authorities around the world to meet its obligations. So thank you. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, that's helpful. Obviously, there's a lot going on. Um, and uh, I'm glad that the U.S. and Taiwan are co collaborating on so, in so many areas. Let me turn now to David. Uh, David, you're an urban planning expert and in, in, in figuring out how to make uh, our, our cities environmentally friendly. Um, I was wondering if you could first, uh, as a two-part question, first discuss sort of what is the state of the art globally about how to make cities more environmentally friendly in terms of zoning, design, other, other policies, about how to measure performance. Uh, you mentioned the scorecard. Um, secondly, I know that you're working uh, uh, on Taiwan issues, collaborating with ITRI, uh, and you visited Taiwan. Uh, what kind of progress have you seen? What's the level of performance? What's the trajectory in Taiwan? Sure, sure. First, I just want to thank CSIS for the invitation to, to speak today. And it's certainly a pleasure to be um, on the panel. 
Um, so maybe I'll actually take your, your second question first on sure. the collaboration with uh, Taiwan and then um, take the first question. So as you mentioned, one of the resources that my organization puts together is something called the, the City Energy Efficiency Scorecard, which is actually a US-based uh, project that looks at the at 51 energy efficient cities in the United States. Um, so a few years back, um, ITRI got wind of the report um, and engaged us to do similar work in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, I believe at the same time the Smart Energy Savings Program mm -hmm. was beginning, so there was an increasing interest on what local governments themselves could do to become more efficient. Um, and so just out of conversations with ITRI and ACAAA, we started doing some some research together. Um, and the, the first report we did was something similar to our, our city energy efficiency scorecard, but in Taiwan with Taiwan's six largest cities, its special municipalities. Um, and we found some very interesting things. Uh, to begin, uh, cities in Taiwan are definitely taking energy efficiency seriously. Um, there's a number of cities, Taipei, Taichung, others who are setting goals to become more energy efficient, to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there's a number of interesting policies when it comes to transportation as well, offering incentives to use public transit, to purchase more energy efficient vehicles, um, you know, a number of, of interesting things going on. Um, the other thing we've noticed, and this is true for any set of cities my organization has ever looked at, whether it's the U.S. or, or Taiwan, there's always room for improvement. Um, there's more that cities in, in Taiwan can be doing, um, especially on, on the buildings front. But I, I think, you know, what I've seen really speaks to the comments Dr. Lee was making earlier, that there is a tremendous amount of leadership that I'm seeing from my work in Taiwan, starting with the Smart Energy Savings Program, and even with my interactions with the local governments in Taiwan. Um, mm -hmm. Folks are very engaged, wanting to understand what is it that they can be doing um, and improving to become more energy efficient. So it's been very encouraging to see. Um, I guess now jumping to your, your first question on urban planning. Um, so there's a, a, you know, a few different things I could talk about here, but one of the first things that comes to mind when it comes to in, uh, urban planning and environmental policy is the importance of integrating um, land use decisions into transportation policy. Uh, so for a long time, I think these things happened in, in silos. So, you know, I'll, I'll use the U.S. as an example, uh, especially after World War II, you would have um, different zones for residential and commercial. So you have your, you know, your homes over here, your commercial properties over here, and when folks wanted to go get their groceries, you know, go to the movies, whatever it was, um, they had to always get in their car and go places. So it had a lot of energy use sort of baked into the transportation system. So I think there's an increasing recognition that good urban planning means um, providing access to motorized forms of transportation, obviously vehicles and mass transit, um, but also non-motorized modes uh, as well, such as biking and walking and making just more livable cities. Um, on, the, on the building side of things, there's a number of things I could talk about. Uh, an interesting policy initiative is something called benchmarking and transparency ordinances at the local level where building owners um, essentially benchmark their energy use against peers, and it's a way to see how mm -hmm. you're doing, mm -hmm. um, and it can you know, help create um, energy efficiency opportunities. Um, so that's one area. And then there's also something um, called intelligent efficiency, which is the use of information and communication technology um, into different aspects of um, building end use in the transportation system so that you use these sensors and you have these feedback loops so that you can get more information on your energy use and, and hopefully become more efficient. So could talk about a few other things as well, but um, those are sort of the highlights when it comes to innovative things at the at local level. Terrific, terrific. Thank you very much. It's uh, impressive um, how much we're engaging Taiwan, how much you all are, are doing, and how much can be done without, uh, how much can be done voluntarily mm -hmm. through, trans through uh, greater information, greater sharing. Um, it doesn't have to be mandatory regulation all the time, even though that's can, can be helpful. Let me ask a couple questions for everybody. Uh, feel free to, to jump in. Let me first uh, start about, ask about um, one, one thing we didn't talk a lot, a lot about uh, during your, your speech and, and the initial questions about renewable energy. We talked about usage of energy and conservation, uh, but renewable. We know that um, uh, Taiwan has uh, energy challenges uh, and is making hard choices about its energy sources. Um, and uh, I remember as originally part of an original commitment that, that President Tsai met had to be with, with nuclear power. 
and, and phasing out the use of nuclear power and, and switching toward more uh, other types of renewables. Uh, what's the progress on that? What's the, the challenges that, that you're facing in Taiwan? Uh, what ex experiences and ex uh, do we have uh, with regard to renewable energies that we maybe is part of the cooperation between uh, the U.S. and Taiwan? Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, we have this kind of uh, a debate or even in a fight about whether or not to keep the uh, nuclear energy for about 20 years, about 20 years. And then after the Japanese uh, Fukushima uh, incident, the uh, March 11, 2011, I believe, you know, when people saw that the uh, Japanese emperor kneeled down for thousand years, they, the emperor never kneeled down to say sorry to his fellow country, man or woman, in the shelter. Every time he saw that. And then we also see the uh, residents in Tokyo, about 200 miles, 200 kilometers away from that the accident uh, spot. But water is not drinkable. All the Tokyo residents have to line up to buy, to buy this uh, bottle of water from the supermarket. That, that thing, that, that, that those news, you know, uh, when, we, when we saw that in Taipei, I mean, the issue was settled. And then, you know, even the uh, young mother bring the kids, bring the dog, hold the, uh, the cat. They were marched together in Taipei Street, on Taipei Street. It used to be one side marched for 20 years. But after the instant, you know, the ordinary people, every household, just feel that way. So we reached the consensus, and it's under uh, President Ma's administration to terminate that nuclear number plan number four, and that signal the the uh, the the, the stop, uh, termination of the nuclear power by 2025, uh, proposed by President Tsai. Yeah, although of course still we still have uh, sometimes still have some. Uh, claim that you know nuclear power is safe, okay, and in order to uh, uh, to transit from this period to 2025 uh, more smoothly, we ought to keep uh, more nuclear power. But still, we are stage by stage, face by face, we are going to terminate uh, by 2025 the nuclear power. But in order to compensate or to replace all those about. Uh, 13 to 18 percent of the nuclear power. We, uh, we are going to develop 20 percent of the renewable uh, energy, including what uh, David uh, just said about gas in Taiwan City. They are going to, we are going to build three big biogas uh, using this uh, food waste to generate gas and then transfer into electricity. Uh, in terms of wind power, the solar power, now it's billions, billions of dollars or investment are coming to Taiwan. And by the end of the year, the EPA has to review, go through this uh, environmental impact in uh, evaluation, uh, EIA impact, environmental impact assessment, the process. By the end of the year, we should be uh, to grant this kind of uh, permission up to like 8.2 giga uh, wind power. And then they have to go through the uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs to compete uh, the, uh, uh, where to put the, uh, the turbine. So that uh, for the, the, the biogas, for the wind power, and then for the solar power, we uh, also uh, uh, try to uh, you know, provide those, uh, uh, some of the uh, poison men. You know, of course, we are. Uh, recovering those land, but during the process, you know, they can put the the sun uh, uh, power plate on top of it, uh, but the, under the condition that 70 percent of the sunlight will go through, so you still can raise some certain kind of plants to retrieve the metals in the ground or under the ground. So those kind of other pro procedures we are taking, and we believe we'll be able to make it by the 2025. And of course, 
we are also to uh, cut down the usage of the fossil fuel, like the coal. And uh, we would uh, uh, increase the uh, LNG uh, power uh, to 50% by 2025. That's our goal. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Jane? So on the U.S. side, uh, U.S. has uh, obviously a strong track record in terms of diversifying our energy sources and renewables is certainly one area where the U.S. has uh, obviously seen uh, the expansion in terms of solar energy, uh, wind energy, and other sources uh, in combination through our private sector. Our private sector, like the private sector in Taiwan, has been exploring a lot of innovation, innovation and technologies, as well as our subnational governments, our state and local governments as well. We've had um, policies that encourage the exploration of renewable energy. Um, although uh, EPA does not work with Taiwan on the renewable energy front, um, I know that Taiwan has recently also uh, entered into an, uh, an arrangement with our Department of Energy, which has more of the jurisdiction on renewable energy. I believe there is some work uh, between our U.S. Department of Energy and Taiwan. May, may I just sure. add one? Of course. Of course. Uh, we are, we're looking for the, the natural gas from the United States. If we can somehow build a pipe, go through under the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> And in a very cost uh, benefit way, beneficial way, we'd like to have that. <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little long, but maybe we can get it done. Through so, uh, Alaska to then to, uh, you know, along the Midwest yes. to the south. We're having, we're having trouble getting our 15 miles of sub subway out to Dulles Airport. <laughs> so if we, could, if we could figure it out first, and then from there, we'll go on. <laughs> so. Let me, let me ask one more question and then, and then uh, turn things over to the audience uh, about auto emissions. Um, I, I, uh, I lived in Taiwan uh, in, the, in the late 80s, uh, and you mentioned all those motorcycles. Yes. One was mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but right now, uh, I've turned over a new leaf. I'm, I'm carrying out this project on new generation vehicles, uh, including uh, new energy vehicles. Uh, and we know that in Taiwan and in the United States, cars are ubiquitous, uh, as well as motorcycles. Uh, what are trends in, in regulations in, in Taiwan, auto emissions, including uh, fuel economy standards, new energy vehicles, other conservation measures, public transportation, ride sharing? Uh, where are there areas for cooperation between uh, the U.S. and Taiwan? Uh, how does this figure into sort of uh, State of the art in terms of urban planning and, and uh, what we can do uh, through through nonprofits and non-governmental organizations as well. So something for everybody. Uh, maybe we'll start with Jane on auto emissions and then go across. Okay. okay. Um, in terms of the U.S., uh, we don't have a large uh, segment of motorcycles, so our auto regulations have focused on the light and heavy-duty vehicles. Uh, we're now in the process of reviewing some of our regulations, uh, but we've also been collaborating with a number of, uh, of, of partners, uh, particularly in the heavy-duty area. Just recently, I actually was meeting with uh, counterparts in North America about aligning, uh, obviously, our, our, our vehicle emission standards, particularly in the heavy-duty area. Um, and with Taiwan, under our regional air quality uh, partnership, we have been working with, uh, again, partners around, particularly in Asia, in terms of sharing lessons learned both in Taiwan and the U.S. in terms of not only how we uh, regulate uh, the auto industry, but also other components in terms of uh, public awareness and making sure that in terms of environmental education, this is where uh, Taiwan has also uh, excelled in terms of not only uh, the general public, but also the youth. We have a new initiative under the International Environmental Partnership called Kids Making Sense. Uh, where we actually have our youth, our future leaders, uh, helping educate uh, others uh, in our communities about the importance of uh, mobile source as well as other sources. The 
I would like to deviate for just a second because it's something that uh, Minister Lee uh, has talked about and it's an area that we are exploring a uh, partnership with Taiwan is, and that is not just in the auto sector but also in the automobile transport sector in terms of shipping uh, because Taiwan is obviously uh, a leader with regards uh, to uh, being a, he mentioned Kaohsiung as being a, an, an important uh, port and so we have a port initiative where we're also looking at the impacts in terms of air quality um, from ports. Thank you. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, just uh, to follow what Jen uh, just mentioned about the uh, regulation in the port, port area, we, uh, in, we ask uh, the, uh, we ask the, the, the Ministry of the Transportation to require that the ship entering uh, the, the port, we have to slow down the speed, okay? Uh, and then to change, to switch from the uh, heavy oil to the light oil that uh, will contain less concentration of the sulfate. And then we would uh, uh, install the uh, high voltage uh, on uh electricity uh, instead of the, the, the ship to generate their, their own electricity from uh, burning the oil. Uh, and then uh, pollute the, the port area. Okay. And then to go back to the, uh, the city, the urban area, we do, like uh, in Taipei, uh, we build quite a, a good system of the uh, transit, uh, uh, rapid transit uh, uh, railway, like the, the, the most important thing. And then we also introduce this uh, e-bike, or old bike, the sharing ride, the ride sharing uh, things. All those help. And then uh, uh, in terms of truck, uh, we encourage the use, at least stage four and five. We try to replace, as you can see, we, we spend lots of money try to replace stage one, stage two uh, diesel trucks because they, they really are the big uh, pollutant uh, 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 vehicles. And, and for the motorcycle, now not only replacing those uh, one million or uh, you know, year by year, we'll replace all those, those motorcycles that you used before. <laughs> Uh, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, we also encourage uh, the introduction of the uh, e-electricity motorcycle. The, one of the very famous, uh, or quite a few of them, <laughs> but at least the one, the global one, was quite, they are quite innovative now. And so they even introduced their, their, their vehicle to Paris, to Berlin. That's a, another great story I, I don't have time to mention, to share with you. Now, and about the rigid standard, I have three experts here. Director General Tsai, raise your hand. Uh, General uh, uh, Zhang Sunqin, and then uh, Zhang Hongwei-Ning. They, they are all air quality control experts. Uh, Director Tsai, would you like to uh, uh, add a few? About the emission standard. Uh, I think the emission standard, uh, we will follow the new standard uh, we will follow the EU standards, and uh, the stage six will come. Uh, I think it will be if in in uh, in act about the next year. So uh, the the most stringent uh, uh, emission standard will apply in Taiwan, not only in uh, the mobile sources but also in the stationary sources. So. Uh, this is for the emission standard. But uh, besides that, uh, that, that uh, uh, we, we have a lot of the uh, substrate such as uh, to replace uh, the vehicle, such as from the uh, heavy duty trucks and, mm -hmm. and also from the, the surface. The surface uh, uh, heavy duty vehicle, we hope that uh, they can retrofit the uh, DPM, we call the diesel uh, particular future that we make it, make it clear because uh, it almost reached 90 percent of reduction uh, from, from the, what, what they are emission from uh, the, the old time. Uh, that's all. Thank, you. thank you, thank you. Hey David, uh, give me your thoughts about uh, what you see going on in Taiwan elsewhere uh, related to auto emissions, ride sharing, other types of innovations and, and what's the future hold, uh, what, what are the possibilities? Sure, so um, in cities, 
you know, the, the tailpipe emissions obviously aren't usually regulated at, at the city level, but there are a number of ways that cities can impact the, those emissions. So I think Dr. Lee touched on one of the most important ones in terms of expanding public transportation um, so that folks who live in cities have um, opportunities to use more efficient ways to get around than getting in their vehicle. Um, and I think what I was mentioning earlier uh, in terms of changing zoning, so uh, you increase what we call location efficiency, so you're closer to the places where you work and play, essentially. Um, I think that would go a long way towards reducing um, vehicle miles traveled in cities, hence, you know, uh, keeping down emissions from, from tailpipes. You know, and there's a number of other things cities can do to try to increase the energy or the, the penetration of energy efficiency vehicles in, in their cities. Uh, I was mentioning some of the activity in Taiwan trying to encourage more um, electric vehicle buses mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and scooters, as Dr. Lee was mentioning. Um, here in the U.S., there are some examples from Chicago that offers incentives for um, developers to install uh, charging equipment for mm -hmm. EVs or rebates for EV vehicles. So I think that's something we'll, you'll see um, increasing interest uh, in the future. Terrific. Uh, thank you. You all have been amazingly patient out there. Uh, let's now turn over uh, the questioning uh, and comments to the, to the audience. Uh, we are online, so we're going to have uh, someone bring you a microphone, even though it's a small room, we can all hear you. But if you uh, identify yourself, your organization, keep your question relatively brief, uh, we'd love to hear from all of you. So if you want, just raise your hand and we'll get started. Okay, we're going to come right up here in front. Good morning. Good to see you coming back. Okay, thank you. Uh, my, my, my name is Nadia Chow, Washington correspondent for Liberty Times. My first question is that, um, you know, we, we're very proud of the uh, accomplishment of the environmental protection uh, in Taiwan, but in a few cases, you know, uh, a few investments uh, has been approved by uh, your agency, but later on, you know, they are um, encountering difficulty uh, to finish. Um, so I wonder how Taiwan can balance the protection of environment, but also encourage investment. You know, there are some prominent cases, I, 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 bet, I guess you know that. And the second question about um, the electricity shortage, we heard from, um, you know, Taiwanese Business Council and other member mentioned uh, this is something that they, they really worry about, uh, that Taiwan can fulfill the electricity supply. Uh, would you like to, you know, address this issue? Yeah. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> yes, thank you, Ms. Atal. It's really nice to see you again here. Uh, yes, uh, to answer your first uh, question, second question first. Um, uh, not only through the, we have to uh, improve on the supply side of the electricity. As I just mentioned, we are going to uh, install 20% of the renewable energy, uh, solar power, wind power, biogas, you know, uh, those kind of things. And then the LNG electricity. Uh, and at the same time, we like to control the air quality. So uh, in the next two years, we have to uh, go through this pamper uh, stage trans transfer, trans transition period, uh, quite painful, because we have to increase the amount the, of, of the coal uh, by about eight, this two or three more years. And then it will, starting from that, it will increase in all the way to 30%. From now 46% to 30% uh, by, the, by year 2015. So that's one side, that's supply side. But we also like to introduce many, many innovative uh, mechanisms on the demand side, like a time, uh, time price mechanism. Okay? If you are really uh, 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 require or need the electricity at the peak hours, then you probably have to pay a little bit higher price. Because relatively speaking, uh, the energy price in Taiwan is too cheap. I said if money, I would be <laughs> criticized after I go back to Taiwan, but it's real. Compared internationally, internationally it's, it's too cheap. So in this kind of uh, energy conservation uh, era, it's, it's really not so good policy to, uh, to remain that kind of low price. We, we ought to be more uh, efficiency conscious. Uh, so 
Uh, and then we're also introducing the, the so-called uh, smart, uh, uh, how do you call that? A grid, yeah. Yes. So everyone can tell, OK? You, you won't uh, turn on your uh, a washing machine if it's uh, you know, price is high, or the, 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 you know, the, the, the electricity is short, uh, uh, is in high demand. You try to arrange like uh, during the evening, okay? So there are many behavior uh, in a daily life that we can, we can adjust ourselves to, in order to achieve or to avoid this kind of uh, uh, non -re Reversible, in, in reversible, in reversible uh, damage if any accident, nuclear accident occur, because we share the same kind of ge geological uh, character with, with Japan. So many earthquakes. Uh, it's not like uh, a France. No earthquake at all for so many years. So uh, yes, we have to ask the understanding of the general public to work together and then to achieve this common goal. OK. And the, the first question, I'm sorry. Oh, that is the uh, elemental. Yes. Uh, we, we are reviewing the uh, uh, elemental impact uh, in assessment, EIA uh, uh, law, uh, now. And, and also, you know, in the past year, we already speed up that kind of process. Uh, I can give you the, uh, the, the exact numbers, you know. You know, the passing rate is about 95%. Uh, so, um, I hope also to use another example is the, uh, the review process of all these wind power uh, uh, procedures, a uh, reviewing procedure process. It's, it, it should be put, it's only less than half a year. Less than half a year. We are about to complete this 8.2 gigawatts. That's quite, quite a large amount of electricity. So uh, very soon we can share with uh, our public that uh, the process has been uh, uh, modified and reviewed uh, in a good, in a positive uh, direction. Thank you. I'm going to come right here to the second row. Thank you. I'm Rita Chen from the Central News Agency. Uh, my question, uh, I got some data in front of me. Uh, my question is about the uh, renewable electricity. According to the Wiki Wikipedia, the uh, US still uh, count on the renewable en en electricity around, around 15, around 15, one five now. Um, and it's from like uh, 2006, it's just, uh, it's 2006, this is nine around 9.5. My question is for the, for the uh, minister. How can we achieve that goal? Because you just mentioned that Taiwan set up like a 20, right? But uh, comparing with the American, they are just around, around 15. And what's your priority plan for the government to achieve such a higher goal? And then my second question is for Jen. And uh, even the American have, have a lot of uh, natural resource. Why uh, are you still counting the uh, nuclear power? Uh, the data I have is uh, Americans account on the nuclear power uh, around 20. So can you uh, share Americans' uh, experience with us? Thank you. With the uh, lady first? Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, uh, with regards to the um, renewable and, and nuclear power, uh, as I mentioned, the U.S. has been expanding, and, and the figures, I'm glad that the figures support that, have expanding the use of, of, of renewable energy, um, and we will continue to do so. With regards to nuclear, um, that is an area that, uh, frankly, isn't EPA's expertise, so I'm a little hesitant to, to go out on this limb, uh, but I know that uh, the U.S. just um, has uh, determined that nuclear energy is uh, obviously with the right protections uh, can be safe. Uh, that uh, I know that our nuclear regulatory agencies have controls, works very closely with state governments to ensure, the, and, and with utilities, to ensure 
but um, both any new uh, nuclear plants that are built in the U.S. or also existing ones um, need tight controls. Uh, just putting on my former hat, I used to uh, be the um, secretary for the Maryland Department of, uh, of, en of Environment, and we had one. We had one nuclear plant in the state of Maryland. And I know on an annual basis, there was a very thorough review by the nuclear regulatory agencies with the state agencies uh, to ensure, again, that there are safeguards, there are environmental safeguards. So I think that um, uh, we will continue to obviously uh, uh, maintain those high protections. Uh, we are also working with our colleagues in Japan as a result of the Fukushima uh, disaster a number of years ago. Um, so we are trying to learn from the Japanese experience as well as to share what um, lessons we have in the United States. So I think that nuclear power, uh, and again, this is sort of out of EPA's uh, uh, jurisdiction, so that's why I'm, I want to make that as a caveat, but I believe that uh, in general, the U.S. Um, is working very closely with all our partners to ensure the safety of those facilities. Yeah, thank you, Rita. Uh, it's a matter of uh, management and uh, will of the society. I just came back from uh, Denmark uh, late June this year. And 30 years ago, when the oil crisis occurred, they don't have enough energy. So they say when they wake up in the morning uh, and they don't have hot water for a shower, they determined, they decided that they have to be self-efficient. So they, they try to transfer anything that can be used as energy. Like they collect all this uh, uh, woods the, the, and the, the, the wheat, uh, you know, after they harvest the, the wheat, you know, they, they squeeze them into a bundle. And then some of the village, you know, totally self-sufficient by using those kind of material. And in Taiwan, in the past, because Thai power, I'm sorry to say this, is the monopoly, the only one who produce and distribute the electricity. So they are not uh, very active uh, in, in, in introducing this kind of uh, uh, alternative form of energy, like wind power or, or, or any, like biogas. And we have so much food waste for the time being, we are going to install, just, we just talked about, the Taiwan mayor, Mr. Lin, asked for uh, assistance. We just answered yes directly in just one second. We said, let's do it. Okay? And then we're going to install one in the north, another one, the third one in the south. And then that's only concern about uh, uh, 800,000 pounds. And uh, still have more. And then the switch, you can also turn the switch and also the life, the, the excretion of all the pigs, uh, livestock. We have 550 million uh, uh, pigs. Uh, we can also, Denmark, Holland, uh, Netherlands, they all transform those, you know, uh, organic waste into energy. And, and since we introduced uh, or claim, uh, uh, publish this kind of wind power and solar power as a national policy. Thousands, thousands of billions of dollars are coming to Taiwan from the CIP of the Denmark, from Germany, from Great Britain, from everywhere, from the United States, from Singapore. I, I, can, I can share with you, I mean, after I go back, the, the real data. And so, it's it's the, a matter of management, a matter of policy, a matter of the will as a society as a whole. Whether what you are going to choose, the absolute safety from freedom of fear. I learned from that, that gentleman, <laughs> Mr. Wang. It's, it's from Mr. President Roosevelt, uh, freedom of fear of this nuclear, uh, nuclear accident. You are going to choose that or a more stable energy, you know, we just, or, and pay some price, pay some price. We just have made a choice, and I believe we are able to 
to achieve that goal. Through all kinds of uh, 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 not systematic, not systematic measures. I think we have time for just one more question. We're going to come right here in the front. And uh, those who didn't have time can come up afterward and, and ask. John Zan, <coughs> excuse me, John Zan with the CTI TV. A question for uh, Jane. Um, the uh, EPA cooperates with many countries in the world. Um, is there anything um, about Taiwan that is special, that is particular uh, for the US to uh, cooperate with for the minister? Um, is there anything that you are seeking from the U.S. in phasing out nuclear energy in Taiwan? Thank you. L let me try to answer that. Um, y y the short answer to your question is yes, there's something extraordinary about Taiwan as was demonstrated, I think, in the dialogue this morning in the presentation that Minister Lee has mentioned about the leadership that Taiwan has uh, exemplified on so many fronts, both in terms of what um, uh, Minister Lee's uh, agency is doing, uh, EPAC, but also in terms of what the private sector is doing in, in Taiwan. I made allusions to the, to the uh, uh, civil society, the uh, education front, and there is so much that um, we have learned uh, through the years and our ability right now through, again, Taiwan's leadership under the environmental, uh, International Environmental Partnership, we are able to reach so many partners, uh, whether they're in uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia. We are also now involving partners in Latin America and in Africa and other parts of the world to, again, um, we have a, as we have one planet, and we're all um, in this together in terms of, of being able to share not only uh, solutions, but also share problems together uh, with regards to being able to work to identify and increase that awareness of not only uh, the problem, but of the solutions. And Taiwan, I think, exemplifies uh, the best uh, of that. And so we have uh, enjoyed working with Taiwan and being able to share um, what we have learned from Taiwan with other partners around the world. OK. <laughs> Thank you, John. It was <laughs> nice to see you again. You are good in good shape. <laughs> oh, friend. So yeah. I do have a very serious uh, request and very important issue to share with our friend uh, in the US, particularly from the Department of Energy. If we are going to uh, terminate the nuclear power plant or nuclear power energy, we have to take care of all those nuclear waste. We have purchased all the material from the US. And we have very good relationship with the U.S. about the amount that we, we already uh, used and the amount we left over and the waste that we create or generate. Uh, because this is very important material. Uh, in, in a way, it's more security, uh, more national security material, all those kind of nuclear material and waste. So because the uh, uh, United States has the uh, expertise. Uh, I have the scholar, uh, Professor Ma, uh, of National Taiwan University with me. If uh, more scientific issue, I would uh, look into him. Please sit, please be sit. <laughs> uh, and also, the United States has such a wide area of desert, desert, desert. You are, you are doing some preparation for storage of the uh, nuclear waste. So I do hope if the United States can over, can lend a hand to help us to clean, uh, because we do have money put in reservation, billions, billions of dollars, because for every dollar of nuclear energy, we, the dollar we require, we save some portion of it as deposit to, uh, to dismantle the, the, the nuclear power plant in the future. So we do have some reservation, billions of dollars uh, deposit over there in the central bank or in the bank. 
And we have to clean all those in the future. And I hope the, uh, our US friends and the scholars uh, can help us on this regard. We do have a difficult time doing this. We have found some place they are going to accept that. But you know, because of this uh, very uh, uh, sensitive uh, uh, international politics, we were not able to send it out or explore that. We have to keep in the, in the nuclear power plant for the time being. And I myself ask our colleague, my colleague, we are going to clean anything that was dumped uh, in the past 30 years during the, this economic developing stage. Because some of them are buried on the ground. And you, you can pretend you don't see it. But I believe, my belief, is that we have to save the earth, the land, the beautiful island, to return to its very nature face, 1,000 years ago, 400 years ago, the Formosa, Irasa Formosa uh, era. So we are going to anywhere, in the river, under the river, in the valley, all the farming land, everywhere, as long as we find it, we will try to clean it up. So we also have to clean up the nuclear power west. So that is something I really need assistance from our friend here. Yeah, thank you. Well, this has been an a, um, enlightening discussion. Uh, uh, these days, um, there's a lot of anxiety in the United States and elsewhere about the environment, about climate change. Uh, I think what we've uh, heard today is that there's also a lot of progress. Uh, Taiwan is small, but provides a lot of powerful leadership uh, through, actual, through direct engagement, through uh, its example, um, both from government and the private sector. A lot of innovative things uh, that you've mentioned that we discussed this morning. Uh, I want to thank uh, my team here, the Freeman Chair, uh, for helping us organize uh, our cooperation with TechRo and Deputy Representative Lee as well. Uh, Minister Lee, uh, Acting Adminis Assistant Administrator Nishida, uh, David, uh, everyone please join me in thanking them. Thank you.